is, the churches are failing you at sex. This is a painting by a surrealist that I think captures the sort of attitude. This is what a lot of evangelical churches want you to do. Be intimate, but don't be intimate, right? You get confusing, conflicting messages. Vague, not technical, not comprehensive. I, don't, I feel like I don't have a sexual ethic, just some rules. I'm scared to do anything. This failure leads to trauma and to pain. This is one study that I found of, tragically, many that I discovered, of the experience of Christian women having chronic uh, dyspareunia. That's just, that means painful sex. These are married women that um, they followed all the rules of the church, they got married, and they had chronic pain. This was uh, one passage that stood out to me. The clinical observations were that women who experienced the most severe painful sex, that's what that acronym is, when excluding those who did not experience sexual assault or abuse, were practicing Christians who grew up in a conservative Christian environment. These clinicians said there were women who presented symptoms similar to rape victims that were not raped. The only difference was they grew up in a Christian environment. This is tragically the story for a lot of Christian uh, women. I followed all your purity rules. I just got married. What's, what do I have to look forward to in the future? Well, sex is unbearable, and you can't tell your husband no. This is bad, right? And unfortunately, I think that a lot of people overcorrect and say, well, therefore, the entire thing is out, goes out in the garbage, right? But that's not what we're going to do today. We're not going to say, oh, therefore, everything that Christians ever do is bad, right? No. Um, we're going to take a different approach. And my goal tonight is I want you to be hopeful, whoops, sorry, hopeful, demystified, and equipped. Hopefully, you'll, you'll be more hopeful about your sexual future. Sex will seem a little less mysterious to you, and you'll be better equipped to navigate these questions of sexual ethics to make these decisions on your own so that you're not left in the lurch, okay? So here's going to be our outline for tonight. I understand this topic is extraordinarily sensitive for some of you. You may not feel comfortable uh, raising your voice and asking a question. So if um, this link right here is a way you can submit anonymous questions if you'd like. But if you want to raise your hand, we'll have time for that too. So here's the outline. First, we're going to start in the Bible. I'm going to look at two strands of texts, uh, and then we'll pull that together into an application, namely premarital sex, because that was like the number one topic. Then we're going to look at the science to talk about a biological account of sex, both how genitalia are formed and how babies are made, and then pull that together into an application on the second most uh, uh, popular question, contraception. And then uh, the rest of the time will be for Q&A, discussion, Hopefully, that will be about half of our time, okay? Because I don't want to lecture you all, all day, all right? So, does anyone know who this is? Zoidberg. Zoidberg, that is correct. I have stolen this from Dr. Green. He used Bender. I prefer Zoidberg. So, there's a lot of stuff I'm going to have to gloss over, naturally. Uh, Zoidberg is going to be there to help keep track of these uh, loose threads. And so, if you see him on the slide, that just means we can come back to that later, okay? Yes. You what? Doesn't what doesn't work? Which? Oh, oh no. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's, yeah, go to, just go to the URL sex queue. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh no, what a disaster already. Okay. Well, I guess you'll have to, uh, you have to, no, too bad. You have to, uh, no anonymous. All right. Okay. Good deal. So let's start with a biblical account of sex, all right? So there are two major classes of texts I'm going to be looking at. There is sex in just about every book in the Bible, but we've got to narrow it down somewhere. So the first one is going to be the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs is the um, longest single meditation on sex in the entire Bible. It is also told uh, predominantly from a female perspective, unlike many other books in the Bible. And the thesis of the Song of Songs is that it is a celebration of erotic love, okay? And the very first passage really sets the tone. She says to her beloved, she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips, for your sweet loving is better than wine. And that term, sweet loving, is the Hebrew term dodim, which is a much more intense term than just love or you know, gentle affection. Here are some other passages you can look at. It comes up in Proverbs and Ezekiel. Oh, that's a typo. Uh, Ezekiel. 
Um, and in both of these cases, it is very much sensual, uh, sexual in nature, okay? So when she's saying, kiss me with the kisses of his lips, this is not a gentle peck or a mug down at the night yell. Like, it's pretty intense, okay? <laughs> and the rest of um, the book continues on with this uh, vision in mind. So um, there's extensive use of garden imagery to evoke both the Garden of Eden, with you know, the story with Adam and Eve and all that stuff, as well as aphrodisiacs. So uh, here is... Another one, uh, she says, Awake, north wind, O south wind, come, breathe upon my garden and let its spices stream. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its delicious fruit. I believe the, it is ancient, but the metaphor, I believe, comes through as to what's going on. The very next verse, the man responds saying, I have come into my garden, I have taken all of the fruit. You may connect the dots as you will. Uh, another passage, she says, Come, my beloved, let us go into the fields, lie all night among the flowering henna. There I will give you my love. The air is filled with the scent of mandrakes. Mandrakes are referenced one other time in the Bible, Genesis 30, where they're explicitly used as aphrodisiacs. Okay? Another thesis within the book is to enjoy intimacy, but not too early. So here we have another passage of intimacy. I am in the fever of love. That's pretty intense, I would say. His left hand beneath my head, his right arm holding me close, very intimate uh, embrace. It's actually depicted here by Egon Church. Um, and then right when things get spicy, she says, Daughters of Jerusalem, swear to me by the gazelles and by the deers of the field that you will not awaken love until it is ripe. So again, intimacy good, but wait, there's a bit of a warning attached to that. Okay? Intimacy warning. And finally, the the pinnacle of the book comes in chapter 8, where uh, it communicates the core wisdom that love is powerful and it is valuable beyond measure. So she says, bind me as a seal upon your heart, a sign upon your arm, for love is as fierce as death. It's jealousy bitter as the grave. Its sparks are a raging fire, a devouring flame. Great seas cannot extinguish love. No river can sweep it away. If a man tried to buy love with all of his wealth, he would be despised. Find you a gal that will sing those songs to you, right? <laughs> so this is the core thing, that love is enormously powerful. It is also something that is worthy of celebration. Or, in summary, sex is good, actually. Okay? That is basically the thesis of the Song of Songs. Now, you may be thinking, hmm, why have I not really heard this before at my church or my youth group or what have you? Um, well, two reasons, allegory and fearful pastors. So here's one passage to illustrate this. Uh, she says, all night between my breasts, my love is as a cluster of myrrh. Well, here's one pastor whose name's Harry Reader. Here's, a, here's his response to this. I'm intimidated. I don't want to preach this. I'm scared of this, right? Uh, historically, this has been practiced throughout the, uh, with the, uh, the rabbis who inherited this book, as well as early Christians also had intimidation. So here is origin, but here's his response. He says, oh, wait, 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 I got you, bro. You don't have to deal with the sexuality because the myrrh, that's Jesus, and the breasts, that's the Bible. The left one is the Old Testament. The right one is the New Testament. <laughs> you think I am making this up. I check this. I, this is real. So when you have a guy who says, I'm terrified to talk about this, and another guy who says, oh, well, if we just squint really, really, really hard, we can get rid of the sexuality, you have something kind of like this scenario, I would say, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nothing to see here, please disperse, okay? So, that is the core thesis. Sexuality is good. The Song of Songs is a celebration of that. If you struggle with having a healthy view of sex or if, something, or if it's something that scares you or frightens you, then live in the book. Meditate on it. It's, God, it's God's wisdom given to you for this purpose. Memorize it, meditate on it, let it transform your view of sexuality, okay? So let's move on to the next strand of um, the Bible, which are the one flesh uh, texts, okay? So in Genesis chapter 2, in the second creation narrative, we have a very famous passage which says uh, where Adam and Eve are created, Eve is presented before Adam, Adam responds, this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. The narrator then says, Therefore a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Lots of potent theology here. We are only interested in the New Testament ethical applications. 
Jesus, in his disputations with the Pharisees, said, this rules out divorce because one flesh unions are lifelong, they're indissoluble. What God has joined together, let no one separate. Okay? The other pillar figure in the New Testament, Paul, expands on this and says that the one flesh union should inform the way that husbands love their wives, to love their wives as Christ loved the church, because in the same way that a husband and a wife are one flesh, analogically, Christ and the church have become one. Okay? Husbands should love wives as they do their own body, for they are the one flesh. So we can see that this is something that is sort of sexual, but also like way more than just mere sex, right? However, Paul also uses the one flesh text in an ethical application about prostitution. He says, do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her, for it is written, the two shall become one flesh. And so we can see here that this one flesh, it is more than sexuality. It's more than just mere sex because this is a comprehensive union. It is also used for analogical purposes as well. But it's not less than sex, right? Because transactional uh, sexual encounters with prostitutes, those count as one flesh unions. So it's more than sex, but it's not less than sex, okay? Tracking so far? Okay, so let's kind of bring this together into the number one requested topic on the survey, which was, why is premarital sex? Why do people go so crazy about that? And um, it's essentially the idea is that if you respect the wisdom of the Song of Songs to not awaken love before it's time, and if you respect the teaching uh, that one flesh is, that is the way by which um, love is consummated, then you have the ingredients to realize that the type of relationship that is expressed through a one flesh union, i.e. having sex, that has to actually be codified in some way, and our cultural way of doing that is through marriage. Okay? Or here's a diagram to illustrate this. Whoops, I think I, I lost something in this. Anyway, uh, so here I'm summarizing uh, the argument made by Alex Proust in this book right here. It's a good book, One Body. It's on your resources. Uh, what took him 105 pages to say, I will say in a single slide. If on the personal level you have um, this, yeah, something seems to be wrong here. Okay, sorry about that. Th there's supposed to be a blue circle here and a blue circle here to show that a person is more than a body but not less than a body. Now it's showing that a person is not a body and that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, if on the personal level, if you say to your boyfriend, girlfriend, what have you, hey, this is a non-committal relationship. We're, you know, we're just feeling things out. We're going to see if there's something here but you're engaging in sexual intercourse, then your bodies are saying to each other, this is a binding one flesh relationship. And so the idea is that you need to have this, whatever is here in the blue, needs to be in sync with whatever's here in the red. So whatever your personal relationship is, it needs to be proportional to your physical relationship, right? Make sense? And this also kind of is, uh, forms the ingredients of the other question, which Zoidberg has pointed out, how far is too far before marriage, right? I'm sure everybody has thought about this or uh, has heard this asked, but here you start to see the ingredients that whatever is true here has to be true here. Make sense? This is on your handout as well. On, that's the first, uh, the first uh, picture there, okay? Now, I've been using wisdom text from the Bible to make this point, but we can actually infer a lot of this uh, just from the natural fact that sex makes babies, right? You can observe mating patterns uh, in, uh, between chimpanzees that uh, resemble something close to marriage because just in the basics of evolutionary game theory, it turns out if you engage in an act that might result in offspring, there is a presupposition that there's some degree of unity between those persons and commitment of those persons that extends for a length of time. In our conventional American 21st society, 21st century society, um, that would be about 18 years, right? Because it takes about 18 years to raise a child. So at minimum, you can say, just from the very fact that sex makes babies, there's a presupposition of um, some type of a relationship and long-term commitment there. Which then brings us to our next question, which is the question of questions, the hallowed question that echoes through the generations and comes to us now. Because I just said, sex makes babies, but how is baby formed? <laughs> So, the question that we take up now, 
how girl get pregnant. <laughs> this has actually completely ruined me. When my wife announced, uh, when my wife was first pregnant with our first child, she left the pregnancy test for me to discover in the bathroom, and I found it, and I went up to her excited, and I said, tu eres pregante? <laughs> yes, so anyway, thank you, uh, Kava, or whoever you are, for, for that. So now we're going to talk about the biological account of sex. But I think now is a good time to at least pause for a second and ask if there are any brave souls who would venture a question or ask for clarification on what I've said so far. That is an excellent question, yes. That is, a th um, that is something that chemically excites your sexual prowess, right? So, like, it's something that you eat it and you become aroused, put it that way. Okay. Any other questions? I'm pulling up the anonymous questions right now. Could you clarify what you meant by saying even... Um, Transactional sexual encounters are one flesh Yes. So what that's getting at is that Paul, um, whoa, what did I just do? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so Paul, you asked that question? Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, so Paul is saying, do you not know when you engage with a prostitute, you are making yourself one body with her? So he's essentially saying that, um, like, there is no commitment in a relationship with a prostitute. Um, but nevertheless, he's saying that bodily interaction, that is being one flesh, but only partially so. Okay. So that's why I was saying that the one flesh union is more than sex. It's supposed to be this all-encompassing, uh, lifelong devotion of one to another. But Paul's saying you're just ripping out the heart of it and, and leaving all this other stuff behind whenever you unite with the prostitute. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Any other questions? We're doing excellent on time, by the way. So we'll have a lot of time for, for questions. Okay, here is an interesting question I will address while we're at it. If you have seen illicit content before marriage, is that considered a form of premarital sex or fornication? Here's the short answer, no. Here's the longer answer. Uh, it's not a, a good idea to do that. But um, I presume this is referring to like pornography and, and things like that. So this is where things get really murky because on a true physical level, like, no, it's just not true. Like, if you masturbate, you're still a virgin, right? Like, there's not, that's just not, that's just the case. However, psychologically, this is where things get interesting because the chemical pathways that are engaged whenever you're watching pornography and, um, and self-pleasuring yourself, those are the same psychological chemical pathways that are activated when you're with your wife or your husband. Um, and so what's happening is that psychologically, your brain is forming a connection to whatever that image is on the computer that is sort of reinforcing, oh, this is the thing that I should have emotional commitment to, right? This is actually something Anna gets into in much more detail in her uh, video. So I'd recommend that for whoever asks that. Uh, she spends like a lot more. She's also like a clinical psychologist, so this is much more in her, her area. Okay, great question. Thank you for that. Okay, so now then, let's talk about biology for a second. Um, now, I'm going to talk about two parts. The first part is we're going to discuss external genitalia. Sorry, things are going to go whew, really intense. Here, I'll put my trigger warning, but there we go. Uh, things are now going to go up really fast. Um, I will be brief. I will be anatomical. I will not be salacious, okay? But it is necessary. Um, I'm going to talk about two parts. So first, we're going to talk about the external genitalia, where those things come from, why they matter. Then we'll talk about how pregnancy actually occurs. And then we'll talk about contraception briefly, okay? So you may be, one, one of the major hurdles when approaching the biological differences of the sex is that the other seems so other, right? Like how on earth, like what's going on down there? Because you, you have no idea, right? Well, one thing that I think is very helpful is the fact that um, in utero, this fun fact, I love embryology, very cool stuff, uh, in utero, the tissues that make up our genitals are the same. And up until six weeks uh, in utero, there's really not a difference. It's only after six weeks that it begins to differentiate. So that means if you understand your own genitals, you have a window into the other, right? The other sex, that is, okay? If you don't believe me, I'm gonna show a diagram. Emotionally prepare yourself. 
So here is a video of what that looks like, okay? Try to guess which one's male and which one's female. Pretty cool, huh? Also, I hope that wasn't too egregious. Alrighty. So there, you can see it. Uh, it's color coded. These are the same tissues. Okay. So you might be asking, why on earth should I care about this, <laughs> right? Other than interesting biological fact. Well, one of the questions that was brought up in the survey was, what happens when I am married and we're not having good sex and it's not fun? Right? Well, for a lot of women, unfortunately, that is just the reality, right? So here's another fact, or sorry, another stat. There is what's called the orgasm gap. Men, when surveyed, respond about 95% of men will say that they achieve orgasm most, of, most or all of the time when engaging in sexuality, or engaging in sex, sorry. Whereas that number is only about 65% for women. Now, there are a lot of reasons for why this is the case, but one of them is physiological and can be addressed by the fact that I just shared with you. Uh, namely, that men do not understand the role of the clitoris in the female orgasm. I know, everyone's very uncomfortable. If you want to giggle, that's fine, okay. <laughs> they don't understand the role of the clitoris, okay? Approximately 80% of women, including gentlemen, your future wives, 80% of them, will require some degree of clitoral stimulation to achieve orgasm. But statistically, only 60% of men respond that they know this, which tracks pretty well, right? 65% of women said that it, the sex is good, and 60% of men say, oh yeah, I know what this thing does. Tracks pretty well, right? But if you understand that these things map onto each other, now you have a degree of physiological empathy, if you will. Because if you understand how this thing works, then you know how this thing works. So that is my message for you gentlemen, to become a student of your wife's body. Landry, are you going to post this one on Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Post it. All right. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions about that? I promise it gets way less intense after this. So you were way through the, the most intense part. And like I said, this was a question on the survey. I did not include that just because. Yes, sir? Could you comment on how circumcision relates to this discussion um, in the sense of if the glands and the clitoris are kind of the same yeah. organs and things like that? Uh, are you? physiologically have the same group? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to show, like, a super graphic picture. But, yeah, there's some of the same, like, skin folds and things like that uh, that, that are involved. But I don't think that... Like, female circumcision, I don't think, is the same thing as that. Um, but I will say, though, for, uh, for men who are circumcised, uh, the glands is less sensitive than men who are circumcised. So there's that. But OK. I will check really quickly on the anonymous things. Are there any other questions? Any other questions? Like yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you type it, I can see it. OK. Good deal. Any other, any other questions? Yes? What about intersex people? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, the UG is not in response to intersex people. It is in, <laughs> it is in response to David, specifically. <laughs> so yes, great question. Um, intersex people, so whenever uh, that video that I showed, I won't show it again. But that video that I showed, that's triggered by uh, various hormone cascades. Okay, I'm, try I'm trying to be sensitive to the business majors in here who are scared by science terms. But, uh, <laughs> but the, main, uh, the, the main thing is, um, like I said, prior to six weeks in utero, most everybody looks the same uh, um, with respect to genitalia. There are conditions, and uh, what happens is at six weeks there is a series of hormones that are released that then cause that differentiation. The main hormones are androgen hormones. There's like a whole bunch of them, but collectively they're called androgens. Uh, and that stands, andro means man, and gen means to make, so male-making hormones. And then estrogens would be for the females, 
where estrus, Greek expert, would you like to tell us what estrus means? No, that's not the normal word we would use for females. Yeah, correct. <laughs> that is correct. Uh, they would better be called gynogens, but they're called estrogens. Estrus means uh, hysterical. So <laughs> the two genders, male and hysterical male. <laughs> yes. That's true. If you want to know what estrogen means, that's what it is. I think gynogen is a much better word because gynos means, means woman. So, yeah. So if you have what's called androgen insensitivity syndrome, what that means is that when you were an embryo at six weeks, you get a whole bunch of androgens thrown at you and a little bit of estrogens, but your body doesn't respond to the androgens. It only responds to the estrogens. And so you grow up genetically. By the way, that, that cascade, that hormone cascade, it's triggered by uh, the Y chromosome the SRY region on the Y chromosome. So that's what's triggering it. So genetically, uh, you're male. Like if you took a blood sample, you would find the Y chromosomes. But uh, as far as the, as the genitalia goes, um, externally, it would look like a female or very similar to a female. So that's what that is. And that affects like 0.001% of people, I think, who have total androgen insensitivity hormone or syndrome. You know? So yeah. OK, great question. Now then. We'll move to the next biological question, which will be relevant for our direct application. So this is how the babies are made, sperms and eggs, OK? So basically, new life begins when a sperm cell fertilizes an egg cell. Here is a diagram for that. The sperm cells are released after uh, sexual intercourse into, um, into the woman. They swim up into the uterine tube. Meanwhile, the ovary right here releases an egg cell that's going uh, through the down chute. They meet in the middle, boom, fertilization occurs right here. There's a really cool video that I love, uh, which shows this exact moment happening. Isn't that cool? That is an egg cell being fertilized. It's releasing zinc particles when that happens. And so that is a human person. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so that's, uh, that's what happens. And then once uh, fertilized, it travels down this tube and then implants into the uterine wall. OK, good stuff. Um, I'm going to show another scientific diagram. This will be relevant, I promise. So this is a cross section of the male uh, anatomy. The sperm is made here in the testes. And the sperm cells travel up this tube called the vas deferens. So when we get to contraception, you may have heard of a vasectomy. Maybe your dad had one. And that is cutting this guy. So you snip this, cells don't come up. There is a similar structure with um, women over here. This is the ovary. This is where the eggs are made. And this is that uterine tube where the eggs come down here. So you can have what's called, if uh, a, a woman, a tubal ligation. And that's where you snip this. So they're exact same procedure. You either snip this or snip this, but it keeps the gametes from getting out. OK? Make sense? Good deal. All righty. Any questions? We all know how babies are made. All right. Um, now we're going to talk about contraception. So in the interest of time, I won't have enough time to really get into the arguments for and against. But what I can do is I can describe the positions and give you a short comment on each. Okay? So a lot of people think there's only one question about contraception. And I'm actually curious. Who, who here would say is the, the most important ethical question? Sorry. Who here can offer what they have heard is the most important ethical question related to contraception? This can be anybody. Okay, that's, yeah, that's one. Does anybody else have one? Yes. Yes, that's right. Is that what everyone else has heard? That one's also a good one, but that's the more popular one that I've heard, right? Is this an abortifaciate? That is, and everyone defined, I, I looked up a church website, uh, and it said, um, should Christians use contraception? And the only thing that was discussed is what is an abortifacient? So my encouragement for you is to recognize the debate is way bigger than this, okay? Because the first, because there are four major positions on this issue. Uh, this is on the back of your handout, by the way. Um, the first question is, is family planning okay? Family planning just means spacing out babies. There are a lot of people, particularly Christians, but there are some non-Christians, who would hold to what's called, who would say, no, 
not okay to do family planning. Um, and this position is often called quiverful, okay? Has anyone heard of this before? Okay, good, yeah. This comes from a line in the Psalms which says that um, blessed is the man that has a bunch of kids. They're like arrows. Blessed is he whose quiver is full of them, blah, 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 right? This would be like uh, that group, what is that, 18 kids and counting? 19. 19 kids and counting? Wait. There you go. Um, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. So that's, that's one major position. Now, to go on the complete opposite, so if you say no. If you say yes, the next question is, is abortion okay? And here we end up with the polar opposite of quiverful, which is abortion. Okay. I will be very brief and simply say that um, if you are a scientifically informed person, this should not be on the table uh, for you. So we'll just move on. Maybe in the ancient world before they knew about embryology, okay, but... Now that we understand where human life begins, I think that if you have an ethical system, Christian or otherwise, that says it's not good to kill innocent people, I think you're going to have a problem there, okay? I'm including it for, for uh, completion's sake, okay? And if you say no, again, as most people do, we can come back to that, then uh, the main question here is, is contraception okay? If you say no, or sorry, if you say yes, you're in the contraception camp, and if you say no, you'll be in what's called fertility awareness or sometimes called natural family planning. I do not like the term natural family planning because the word natural and nature is radically misunderstood. So we're just going to talk about fertility awareness, okay? Um, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm not going to talk about that. We can come back to it later. I'm just going to focus on these two. Like I said, I'm not going to make an argument for or against them. I'm just going to describe them, okay? So what is fertility awareness? Well, we have to start with a fun biology fact, and that is that women are only fertile about 25% of the time. Did you know that? How many of you have been told you can get pregnant at any time during the month? Yes. Well, there is an asterisk up here I will highlight, so you have not been entirely misled. But in general, it is, for most women, it is approximately true that 25% of the time is um, the window for fertility, okay? So who knows what this is? Mostly the men. I know the women know what this is, right? <laughs> so this is uh, the menstrual cycle um, right here. And so as you see here, right here, this is the key point in the middle, which we call ovulation. This is when the egg is released. There's a huge surge of these two uh, hormones right here. Um, that's uh, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, that big peak. I'm sorry, business majors, but that, yeah, the big peak right here. And then uh, after ovulation, we have this hormone progesterone, which comes in uh, after the fact, okay? And so basically the idea is if there is no egg, there is no baby. And when is there egg? About 25% of the time. That's basically uh, how it goes. So a typical cycle for a woman looks something uh, kind of like this. Again, uh, we'll talk about, as it says, the windows and the cycles vary person to person. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but in general, if you're assuming a 28-day cycle, you have five days of menstruation, but the fertility window right here is only about three to seven days for most women, okay? So seven out of 28 is a quarter. That's where that's coming from. Make sense? Pretty cool, I think, yeah. Uh, men do not have this, obviously. We are constantly, the, the factories are constantly working, right? So there's no, period, there's no downtime for us, okay. Um, <laughs> So the, uh, yeah, so fertility awareness basically just says, hey, look, if you don't want to get pregnant, then do not do the sex in this time period, and then you will not get the pregnant, right? Um, and what happens is that, uh, yeah, so what you do is you track this. You track these hormone levels, and like I said, there's a really, there's a detectable peak right here, um, this detectable surge, and that is very reliable at predicting when ovulation is. And so if you track this and you know when that's going to happen, then you can have a better idea of when that window is. This is a typical tracker. This is uh, from Clear, Bl uh, Clear Blue is the manufacturer. You pee on a stick and it tells you the hormone levels. That's it. And you'll notice it says it learns and adapts to your cycle. So like I said, no, basically no woman ever has exactly 28 day cycles every uh, single time. I'm sure if I took a survey, we could, we could uh, empirically prove that. But yeah, it's, that's very rare. So uh, devices like this, they're designed to sort of track that and figure out what you or your wife, like what her uh, particular inner workings are, okay? So there you go. That's how that works. Now, 
I said there was an asterisk about the fertile window. The fertile window does not mean 100% chance of baby. This is not how this works. It's not like, oh, there's these three days. If you have sex outside of this time period, 0%, and if you have sex, it's 100%. No, not how that works, okay? As with everything in the real world, there is a distribution and a normal curve. And here is one. This is a very famous one from Wilcox in 2001. The bottom is the day of the cycle. And then here, this is the probability, absolute probability of conception. That is how probable is it you're going to have a baby. Now, um, what do you think this top number is? I don't know if you can see those numbers on the, on the side, but what would you expect this peak value to be? I'll tell you, it's not 100%. 80%? You would guess. Yeah. So this particular study, at the peak, at the very, very peak of fertility, at the height of the, of the fertility window, when the egg has just ovulated, 10% was his calculation. So even if you're on the peak number, his, that calculation was 10%. Now, I will say, as with everything, there are error bars and distributions. Here's a more recent study that found that number at 40%. But there is no study. I looked, I looked at all over the place. Most studies seem to be around like 20%, and then it kind of tails off in both directions. Um, but I've not found a study that says above 50% absolute probability of conception. So even in the cases of... So th this is important when you start dealing with people who ask questions about what's effective and all of that kind of stuff. Well, you have to realize that the underlying mechanism itself has anywhere between a 90 to 60% 90 failure rate, right? So if you say a contraceptive works 90% of the time, you have to factor that in on how they're doing the math, okay? But yeah, does this make sense? Yes? How long does it take to ovulate? Very good question, yes. That is, uh, it's about five days. So that's where these numbers are coming from, right? So if you add, uh, and that's where that window comes from too. The egg itself is only in the track for maybe about two days. But if you add five days for the maximum sperm life, uh, then that's where you get that seven-day uh, figure from. And these, these are taking that into account as well. Um, early, early ovulation. Also, this, is, this study is like 25 years old, so uh, just weird data set. So, yeah, like I said, this one's a little bit more, this one I think has a larger data set, so a little less error. Okay, good deal. So that is natural family planning or fertility awareness. So like I said, the key idea is you're aware of when you're fertile. Do not do the sex when you are the fertile. You will not get the baby. All right, contraception, on the other hand, render, renders uh, the sexual act sterile, okay? Um, and I will show you a picture of the most common methods. So probably the most well-known is the condom. This is a barrier method. If the sperm cannot get past the cervix, then there is no uh, baby. Oral contraceptives or hormonal contraceptives, they suppress that cycle, um, and so they prevent ovulation, usually. Or you have what are called interuterine devices, and these make the uterus here hostile uh, to sperm and potentially to fertilized eggs. Okay? So when people get really up, uh, really up in arms about abortifacient, quote unquote, abortifacient contraceptive, they're, what they're talking about primarily is stuff that makes this area dangerous to implantation, okay? They're not talking about condoms. Make sense? We can talk about that more if that's the direction we want the conversation to go, okay? But those are the options, you, and, and there are like a bunch more. Planned Parenthood is, of course, an excellent resource if you wanna learn all about contraceptives, so there's that. Okay, so those are the main things, and like I said, there are a lot of questions here that Zoidberg's keeping track of. Abortifacient contraception, this kind of gray area here in the middle. Okay. So that actually concludes the presentation. Y'all made it. We did it. I'm very proud of you because this was, it took a lot of bravery to, uh, to go through it. So now the rest of the time is just for conversation. When the clock hits 9.30, we have to leave immediately. That's in about 15 minutes. I'm gonna go straight out the door and go around the corner to the Chick-fil-A. I will talk to you all night if you want about anything, this or otherwise. So do not feel like if you don't get your question answered in the next 15 minutes that it's Jover for you, okay? <laughs> but 
I need to check in with you because I said I had some goals for tonight. So here's my question. So do you feel more hopeful? Do you feel less mystified? And do you feel at least a little bit better equipped? And as you're thinking about this, I actually want to read a story from that paper. Uh, Because you remember that the main uh, impetus for this was that paper that said Christian women have painful sex despite doing everything right. This is the attitude that one of the respondents said. So I'll read from the paper. When asked to share the messages that she grew up surrounding sex, Sophia, one of the women, she said, "Um, don't do it uh, until you're married. But really, all you hear when you're a kid is don't do it. So I think that that phrasing just internalizes in a young person that sex is bad. If you aren't supposed to do something, it's bad. So I think I received that message even though I now disagree with it, and I still appreciate my background. But I've had to deal with anger and how sex was talked about and how it was regarded. I just saw my physical therapist for the first time, and she told me that my body presents similarly to a rape victim, and I just felt victimized by the church. In an effort to make me holy, they made me a victim. And so my hope for you is that at least some of what we discussed tonight can avoid that future for you. And that as you go out and talk with your other friends, that you can actually take that burden on yourself to discuss sexuality in a more healthy way. Because whatever happened with Sophia, we do not want that to happen to anybody. And especially not with the people that we say that the church is the most gracious and loving place you can be. Okay, so that's my encouragement for you. All right, question time. What you got? Anybody? Sorry, I just was looking at like a thousand things on the thing. Okay, uh, sorry, who? Yes. So in the case of like a gentile standard, how would you counsel them using more conflict with somebody that's like Mm-hmm. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Uh, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is like the textbook example uh, for this. So I did not include it. Write this down mentally or physically. The principle of totality. This is an ethical decision-making framework. Um, and that is, if, basically what you do is, if you have to sacrifice something for the sake of the larger organism, that's what you do, okay? Classic example, if my foot is being eaten away by gangrene, you chop it off, right? It is better for me as an organism to have the foot chopped off uh, rather than have it eat up my body. But for me to chop off a healthy foot, that's irrational, right? So the argument that anti-contraception people are going to make is they're going to say, if you're taking you know, uh, the PCOP pill or something like that, uh, because that's what you've been prescribed, you're not taking it for contraception. You're not taking it to render the sexual act sterile. You're taking it to get your ovaries under control. right? So it's not inherently immoral to, to use. It's not like the chemicals themselves are evil and immoral. It's that if you, the argument goes, if you use them to render the sexual act sterile, that's where the, the, the problem is. Excellent question. Yes. Okay, so for the uh, contraceptives that sort of make the, uh, the women reproductive tract sort of hostile, mm-hmm. uh, so is there a scenario, let's say, where an egg is fertilized, does it attack the egg? Yeah, let me talk about that, actually. Okay, I anticipated this question, so I have a slide. (laughs) Okay, important note, terminologically. Okay, sidebar on this. I am extraordinarily pro-life. Any of you that know me know that I I get rabid about this. Okay, so, but one of the things that really uh, gets under my skin is how much the abortion debate is mired by people who are not precise in their terms, and things get bundled together or divided that shouldn't be. So this term quote unquote, abortifacient contraception is very misleading, okay? Um, I actually asked some of you in the Slack, and if I were to ask you now, I think a lot of you may be inclined to think, oh, if I take the morning after pill, that's gonna give me an abortion, right? That's not what this, that's not what this means, okay? What it means is it interferes with the implantation process. That's what people mean by this. So here's the cycle. You have fertilization right here. So that's where life begins, right? And then it travels down the uterine tract, and then boom, day eight, nine, that's when it implants here into the wall of the uterus. Some contraceptives might interfere with this process, okay? 
But after this process, there is, a, there is like, I couldn't find any reliable evidence that any contraceptives work after this point, okay? There are some people who claim that, but I, I can't find any evidence to it, all right? So um, what exactly are they talking about? So the other factor involved with this, so, so yeah, let me back up a second. So you were asking about the, um, what are the actual effects? So anything that narrows the uterine tube here, you, what it'll do is it'll slow down this fertilized egg, potentially, and then it will die somewhere in here and not able to implant. Or it will come down here, it will try to implant, but the wall of the uterus has been thinned by the hormones that have been taken in the pill. Okay, so that's like what, what's in view here, all right? Um, for the sake, this is, a, you can download these slides, but uh, just to kind of outline what people mean when they're talking about the pill to give you more information for this, uh, people will often say like, the pill does this, the pill does that. What is the pill? There are at least four different things that this refers to, so I'm gonna break it down for you real quick. So first you have this, which is mifepristone, that's the abortion pill. This will give you an abortion on account of it being called the abortion pill. Do not use this as contraceptive, it's not indicated for that, okay? The other uh, one that's called the pill is the morning after pill. Um, and this is emergency contraceptive. It is designed, and its mechanism of action is to uh, clamp down and prevent ovulation. Okay, that's how it's designed to work. It also has secondary effects, which thickens the cervical mucus so that the sperm cells that are like swimming, trying to get to the egg, that they will get tired and die. Like, if you hear the term spermicide, that's what that is, okay? Uh, this is the combo pill, which is, this is a contraceptive pill. This is the one that you take every day. It's progestin and estrogen. Um, and so if you remember from earlier with all the hormone levels and whatnot, uh, it, by elevating the levels of progester or synthetic progesterone and synthetic estrogen, it keeps a woman from ovulating, okay? And then lastly, you have what are called the mini pill, which is progestin only. So it's only, it's only the progestin, it's not the estrogen, okay? Now, what this does not work. Its primary mechanism of action is not to suppress ovulation. It's to make the uterus and uh, the vaginal canal hostile to sperm. But the thing is that making it hostile to sperm makes it hostile to eggs. So if you have a breakthrough ovulation, and then if you have a breakthrough fertilization, there is a non-zero probability that the egg will either die uh, in transport or it will die in the uterus. So that's what people are talking about, okay? Now, like I said, this is definitely abortifacient. Of the evidence available, the strongest evidence for being a quote-unquote abortifacient contraceptive is the progestin-only pill. There is some evidence, but it's mostly theoretical for these two, okay? I can give you citations for this if you, if you really want to go down that rabbit hole, okay? Does that answer your question? Good. Excellent. Any other questions? Actually, I need to, I need to respect our anonymous questions, so let me, let me check that real quick. Um, where, where did that go? I'm sorry. I didn't have it pulled up. Sorry, my phone closed. While I'm pulling this up, does anyone else have another question real quick? Uh, Strasser, go ahead. I... Well, so this is where I try to be conscientious about sort of the, the language that I use um, because I don't, I, like I said, reading that, reading that study, you hear, all you hear constantly is this drumbeat of this is immoral, this is evil, this is bad. And I don't think that that really captures like the essence of, uh, of the truth. So I think from a, a rhetorical standpoint, I think it's important if you're sharing Christian ethics to share it with the beauty of what Christian ethics is. And so I think that celebrating sex in a marital environment is way more beautiful and desirable and healthy um, than consummating that outside of, uh, outside of marriage. Um, but I think that there are, there's some empirical evidence to suggest that uh, it's not good for you, right? It's not, it, it does actually harm the individuals. One of the biggest ones being, um, the, the, like I said, psychologically you're, and you know, hormonally and uh, chemically, you're getting messages that this person is bonded to me in a very, very intimate, real, long-term way. Uh, but if, you're, if that's not true, 
then you can start to have some sort of relationship disagreements on, on, that, on that front. Um, and I think it also kind of permeates into the way that we think about sex more generally, right? Because if, you're, if you start with the idea that, um, like the procreative element of sex, that's dispensable because we live in a world of contraceptives, then it starts to erode it the way that you think of relationships that involve sex themselves, right? So like, I mean, straight directly, I would say, yes, it is immoral, but that's not my argument. I'm not gonna say stop it because it's immoral. I'm gonna say you, there's a much better and purer, better way to do this, right? So that's the, from a rhetorical point. Okay, let's see what the questions are. Ooh, excellent question. If someone was drunk and got raped and not even aware of what was going on, do they still become one flesh? Uh, in a very limited sense, uh, it, okay, in a very limited sense, yes, but in general, no. Short answer, no. Longer answer, there are some Christian thinkers who take the one flesh to another level of biological literalism to say that to be one flesh is to operate together as a single organism. So if a woman were, you know, tragically, if she were to conceive uh, a baby from, uh, from an act of uh, sexual assault, those thinkers would say in this very narrow sense they have participated together as a biological organism, right? But in the sense that I'm talking about, no, not really. Uh, like, if, if the question is getting at, do I need to worry about, like, um, you know, the, the, the concerns that I was talking about with premarital sex, like, do those apply? No, the problems are, are rape, which are way worse and more significant than going too far with your boyfriend or girlfriend, right? So that's what I think that is. Is circumcision still a thing? Yes, it is. <laughs> Clitoris is not inside. How good sex when, how? <laughs> how good sex when, when some inside, some outside? How big patty. Okay, pretty much. The clitoris is not inside. Uh, no, not really. It's external genitalia. So um, how good sex when some inside? <laughs> Uh, um, okay, so the, the female sexual experience is uh, variegated, and there are some women who report different degrees of pleasure from different, from different acts, right? Um, but because the, uh, but the important thing to take away from this is that the nerve endings that are involved in a male orgasm are uh, at the glands of the penis, that is involved every time in penetrative sex. Right? That's why males are able to achieve orgasm almost every time during penetrative sex. But women's, uh, for women, the clitoris is not stimulated uh, very often in penetrative sex. Right? So that's, that's why there's that disparity. Uh, Non-penetrative sex and other like manual stimulation and things like that, that's what's being in, in view there. Okay. Um, are condoms, et cetera, to stop sex biblical? I have a very easy answer for this. Are condoms biblical? No, they are not, because latex did not exist. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I am assuming that this is getting at the more general, is contraception biblical? Uh, and I will say that it is very difficult to make an argument uh, for this that is definitive one way or the other. There is a popular text brought up, some of you may know it, the case of Onan. Onan, uh, his brother died without siring any offspring. Um, and so by Librite law, he was required to go to his sister-in-law, his brother's wife, and impregnate her to continue the line of his brother. But uh, he pulled out. And as the KJV says, wasted his seed upon the ground. And for this, God struck him dead. Okay? This is a true story in the Bible. Okay? Now, the conclusion, now what do we draw from this? All right. I love my Catholic friends. I hope there are some Catholics here. Um, I love you guys. My Catholic friends take this way too far, though, and say, any semen wasted on the ground, dead, believe it or not. You will die. Like spiritual, like mortal sin, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, if you've seen Monty Python's Life of Brian, if a sperm gets wasted, God gets quite irate. Okay, that's where that's coming from. Um, I do not think you can go that far. I think that, that Onan's sin was that he did not, uh, stick with the, the command which was to sire his offspring. Like that was where the failure was. He did not, he, he was basically wishing his brother to die and his uh, brother's name to be erased off of the face of the earth, okay? 
Um, but contraceptive in general, I go back to what I was saying with Alex. Rhetorically, I would not say, oh, this is evil, stop it. Okay? Rhetorically, I would say there is a much better approach. And I think, and this is where I've kind of left my personal opinion out of this, but my personal opinion is that the fertility awareness and natural family planning is substantially superior to contraceptive methods because it forces you to reckon with the fact that your body, like the sex makes the baby. It does not let you chop that part of sex off and ignore it. It does not subject the woman's body to the man's pleasure. It actually invites the couple together to embrace the woman for who she is in all of her entirety, in all of her inconveniences, right, for the men, right, ah, I don't wanna deal with another kid, right? In all of that, um, and to do that in a, in a way that is uh, honoring to who she is. And you also learn things like if you're sick or not, like if, you're, uh, if your period's not coming on the right time, or if there's too much blood or things are wrong, like the symptoms that you're able to measure that way that are suppressed with things like hormonal contraceptives, um, those are things that can inform you to learn more about your body. So I think in every respect, fertility awareness, natural family planning, personally, I think it's superior. That doesn't mean that contraceptive is immoral, um, but I, I do think that there are, I, I think that contraceptive has a, uh, contraceptives have an eroding effect on your conscience because when you disconnect those things and you start viewing having babies and having sex as separate and dis, like disintegrated, then I think that starts to warp your, your vision uh, of sexuality. So that's my thought on that. All right, it is 9.30 on the dot. I appreciate it. You guys are troopers. Excellent questions. I will stick around around the corner for as long as as you want.